Hello again everyone, Dr. Dan Bachman here. And it's been a long time since I gave you guys an update. Um, and there have been a lot of significant changes that have happened, new developments that have happened since last time we spoke. So uh, real quick, um, what we'll talk about today is I've had a setback with my diagnosis and my cancer stage. We'll talk about that and what the new game plan is that I have going forward. Um, and um, I'll give you just kind of a brief rundown of what, what the recovery, what the experience was like of my last surgery, which is where they took off the ostomy bag, uh, what that recovery has been like, and uh, some future plans I have, um, even setback notwithstanding. So basically back on, uh, today is uh, October 6th, and my surgery, my last surgery where they took the ostomy bag off, and reconnected my plumbing basically so we run all the food all the way through the normal course that was august 15th so that was about seven weeks ago i've been back at work this is my my uh, wrapping up my first month back at work so I, i'm only working mornings right now um, for reasons i'll explain a little bit but um, and i've been back in the gym i'm only doing like two exercises at a time in the gym maybe three uh, just because that's all I can do right now again for reasons I'll explain but basically the recovery front the last surgery went without a hitch which is great because the one before that is where I was in the hospital for seven weeks and couldn't eat for seven weeks and and drop from 180 pounds down to 129 so I lost over 50 pounds in the hospital just from not eating uh, which you would expect to happen uh, but since then I've been able to eat anything I want I'm eating really well um, and the kind of recovery for this surgery is, and by the way, I'll show you. So this is, this is where my ostomy bag used to be. I don't know if you can see that very well, but I've got about an inch and a half, two inch scar there maybe. And it's healed up really nicely. That's, the, that's a non-issue. Um, the recovery challenges for this surgery have been, um, once you reconnect all the plumbing, um, and remember, I'm minus a rectum, so they took, they took that out. And the rectum matters because it's the holding area for food um, that lets you eat a meal or two meals and not have to go to the bathroom right away. Because you'd think, well, each bite I take, it runs all the way through and comes out. Well, in that situation, if that's how it worked, each bite comes out on its own, you'd have what I have, which <laughs> what I currently have, which is you just in, you're just in the bathroom nonstop as each bite gets processed. Well, the rectum allows food to kind of accumulate so you don't have to go to the bathroom after every bite you eat. Um, it just get, kind of gets stored and then once there's enough to give you the urge to feel like you need to go to the restroom, you do. Well, I don't have a rectum anymore, so <laughs> I just have a straight pipe going through. So I get what I was just describing, which is I mean, 30, it could be more than 30 bathroom trips a day. And it all triggers as soon as I start eating because there's something called a gastrocolic reflex, which is gastro is stomach, colic, colic is colon. So as soon as your stomach picks up, ah, we're getting food, it tells the rest of the digestive system, oh, we need to evacuate things to create room for this new food. So the net effect is lots of urgency. It's, you may have a few seconds. <laughs> I can't get too far away from a restroom. Um, so that makes things like exercise and work challenging and sleep for that matter. So I found some workarounds. So basically I don't eat in the morning. So essentially I'm doing uh, uh, intermittent fasting. Which, so I eat basically between about noon or one and about six. So one to six, I got about a five hour window that I eat. And I don't eat in the morning which means I'm empty when I go to work, which means I can actually, you know, do work and I don't have to sprint out every five seconds. Um, uh, of course, it means I can eat less because I don't have as much time to eat. Uh, and then when I do eat, I have that whole process of sometimes I'll just go eat in the restroom. I mean, this is probably too much information for you guys, but, but in the interest of sharing what the experience is like, that's why I'm kind of letting you guys know about this stuff. So, over time, they tell me that the, even though I don't have a rectum, the current section down there will start learning to be one. 
So it'll learn, oh, I don't have to shuttle things through <laughs> as soon as they come my way. I can accumulate for a little bit, store food a bit before I give Dan the urge to go uh, evacuate. Um, so that's something I have to look forward to. And the frequency will drop off. It won't be every, you know, it won't be as often. I'll have more time to get, to get where I need to go and get rid of things than I have now. And it has been improving. The other thing is, is pain and burning and aching down there. Um, so that, remember, I went months without having used that part of my digestive system. And the skin around that area around the exit area um, over time uh, when we're young it gets used to the kind of acidic nature of the of the food that's coming out of the stool and uh, but when I didn't have any food running through there the skin lost the ability to handle that acidic stuff and so I get I can get I can get a lot of burning that has improved steadily so I still have it and it's a kind of achy raw feeling uh, but it's not as it's not nearly as just gruelingly severe as it was back you know weeks ago when I was right after surgery. All right, so here's here's the setback part. So I went and met with my oncologist last week, um, just as a follow up because we've completed all my scheduled treatment. We did all the the IV chemo, we did the chemo radiation, three or four surgeries. Um, took out the big tumor, took out part of the liver, and then took the bag off. And um, so supposedly I was supposed to be done and we were going to get into uh, just periodic scans to make sure nothing's growing back. So I had my first round of scans. My oncologist ordered that chest, abdomen, pelvis. Well, to my huge dismay, new tumor in my liver one. So we had cut them all out, so this is not a good development. That, and that was not that long ago. That was, well, I mean, it was earlier. It was earlier this year. So, I mean, it may have been eight months ago or something. That was the first surgery I had. It was a liver surgery. Cut them all out, looked good. So I've got a new one growing back already. Now, this is not a mystery because my um, liver surgeon said 80% of the time people's tumors grow back. So that's not as not as big a surprise, statistically anyway. I was hoping, well, I'm younger, healthier, more active, and I'm gonna beat those numbers. Well, apparently, uh, I got a new one. Now, the, the thing that's more, that bothers me more is that, I don't know if you remember, back when I first got all my scans, they were just giving me my diagnosis. They're saying, hey, is this anywhere else? They did a bunch of scans. They found some spots in my lungs. Now they were super tiny, so like two, three, four millimeters, very small spots. I don't remember how many. And we, they said, let's just track those with a series of scans and make sure they're not getting bigger. Well, they weren't getting bigger. So they said, well, maybe those spots aren't cancer at all. It could just be some scar tissue in there from whatever, you know, a respiratory illness in the past that healed and gave us some scar tissue and it shows up on a CT as a no nodule. We don't know if it's cancer or if it's something else. Let's just track them. Well, they never grew. There was never more in number. They were never bigger in size. So huge relief back then was, oh, I guess my lungs may not be involved. Well, now they're growing in my lung. I can't remember if there's any new ones in there. And, and here's the thing. Lung can each cancer has a profile and a way it behaves. Colon cancer is very slow growing and very treatable and plus you can just cut it out so it's one of the better ones liver is worse um, meaning like i said they can grow back even if we do chemo even if we do surgery they can grow back liver is pretty important and my my uh, colorectal surgeon said hey he said it's not going to be the the colon cancer that gets you if anything does it's going to be your liver well lung does even worse than that and I haven't had biopsies yet, but that's the next step. They're going to order a bronchioscopy. Bronchio is bronchioles or the tubes in your lungs. A scopy or scopy is a camera. So they're going to put a camera down me while I'm out, take some samples of some of those spots and test them to see if they're cancer or not. That's the next step. So that's getting scheduled pronto. And then if it comes back, oh yeah, they're, they're cancerous, 
Then we have to consider, hey, what's the best step? And they said it's probably going to be chemo. So here's my problem. Well, first of all, I don't like that. But the problem is that chemo doesn't work that well on lung cancer. Outcomes are not great. It may, you may go through a whole course of chemo, and it's not with the intent to fix you and get rid of the tumors altogether. It's just to buy you a little extra time at the end of your life. And I mean, for example, they, there are some courses of chemotherapy for lung cancer that all they'll do is give you two extra months um, that you might not have had before. And I'll tell you this, my initial thinking right now, without all the information yet, but my initial thinking is, if that's all I'm gonna get for going through six months of chemo and hair falling out and you know nausea and whatever comes with that, if I'm just gonna get an extra two months, I'm not gonna do it. That's my initial thinking. And I'm prepared to have my mind changed by better information, but that's how I'm thinking. So, again, <laughs> the future's uncertain. It always was, it always is. But, but here's how my thinking has changed, just to give you a little snapshot into how my, I've thought about this. So when I first got the diagnosis of cancer, I'm like, wow, that's a whole lot to take. It makes you think about your mortality. Maybe I didn't have as much time as I, as I thought I had, you know, to be 80 or 100 years old. Then as I was going through treatment and all the tumors were shrinking and I was feeling better and, I mean, bathroom trips, everything was improving across the board. I stopped thinking about, oh, I'm going to die. I feel, start thinking like, you know what, I'm going to beat this thing. All the data is telling me this stuff is working. So. Um, I, got, I stopped worrying about dying and I thought more about quality of life and, um, and hey, it's just going to be a matter of running out the clock on this treatment plan and if I can make it through all this stuff, then I have you know, a nice, long, happy life, hopefully at the other end. So dying and then, oh, let's, let's just make it through this treatment plan and then now I'm back to, again, thinking about dying. <laughs> Well, the good news about that, if you can say that, is that I've already thought about it and I've already made my peace with that. I honestly, I don't feel despondent, I don't feel depressed, I don't feel panicky about my life ending potentially sooner than, who knows how much sooner than I would want. I don't feel that way at all, which is weird. I would not have expected to feel the way I feel pretty relaxed about it all. But I think it's because I already had those, those thoughts and I kind of worked through it in my mind and I figured out, you know what? I'm back to thinking about this and it makes me think about things, I have a bunch of, a bunch of stuff I wanna do that's unfinished. Um, you could call it legacy, you know? You think about, well, if I was gone, what would I would like to have done um, or contributed to the world around me? And I can tell you this, top of my list, I mean, other than outside of family and friends and relationships, that's obviously top of my importance list right now. But number two is my, um, professional uh, goals and and basically we haven't talked about this at all really but but I've figured out a treatment approach for musculoskeletal program problems neck back knees hips feet ankles moving parts problems that's what I do for a living is I I do essentially physiotherapy and rehab for those things and I figured out a an approach to both diagnose and treat those things that works way better than anything else I've ever found. I, be, I developed this approach myself without going into too much detail. It works amazingly well. It's, it's the reason I have the reputation I have professionally, which is, hey, if you want to get well fast, go see this guy. So I end up getting a ton of patients who have been everywhere else already. They've had surgeries and drugs and medications. They've been to acupuncture and massage and chiropractors, did two or three rounds of physical therapy. They've got you know, injections of pain medicine and steroids. None of it's worked. Then I get them because they're like, at that point, um, understandably, you might think, I've tried every other doc and I haven't gotten well. Maybe I'll just go to this guy. He's got a great reputation, all these reviews of people getting well for complicated problems that have been there forever. So I end up getting really complex problems, which is what I love. I love solving difficult problems. It's kind of like solving a puzzle. My point is, my goal, professional goal, as far as legacy goes, is getting this treatment approach out there into the world so someone else can take the baton and run with it beyond me. I, I don't want it to die with me, not to be morbid, but I wanted to get it out there. And so to do that, I want to create an online self-treatment um, 
program where it'll walk you through with a little micro lessons how to check yourself out if you've got low back pain, let's say. Figure out what's causing it and then plug in the treatments that fix it and then keep it from coming back for life. That's, that's my program. And I have designed most of, the, most of the scripting and the organization for videos and I want to turn it into a mobile app as well. But I haven't shot those videos. I haven't put it on, on, on tape, so to speak. So that, that is something I want, to, I want to take action on really fast because I don't know how much time I have left. I also don't know how camera ready I will be. If my hair all falls out, I don't know if I want to get on screen. It's just a vanity thing. So I'm going to really work quickly to try to get those things done um, so that there's a good solid framework for anyone else, whether it's uh, a healthcare professional, which I'd love it to spread through the healthcare profession, so that they can give it to their patients and benefit from it. But I also want just regular folks to have access to tools online they can get to from anywhere that walk them through how to fix the shoulder problem, how to fix low back, how to fix knee, how to check yourself out. So that's what I'm really pouring my effort into right now. Um, and that's what's important to me is what I leave behind, whenever it may be. You know, I hope I'm not, you know, we're all going to, we're all going to be leaving here at some point. <laughs> uh, that's understood. Um, but when your departure date is unknown, that's what makes uh, time of the essence for me anyway. So expect to hear more from me on that. I'll certainly post on this channel um, any, as soon as I get these things up and running. Uh, and then the se and once we figure out, oh yeah, this treatment, this online series of little micro video lessons that walks you through things, oh, it looks like it works and people are benefiting from it. Then I want to create a mobile app for it. So it makes it even more accessible. You can just download it onto your phone. Your phone walks you through what you need and you can fix yourself. So in a way, none of this is really about me. It's more about, um, it almost feels like I have this amazing secret solution that I just want to share with the world. So, going forward, I'm still planning for the future. I booked, a, <laughs> I booked a camping trip for a couple of weeks. I'm going to go camping by myself. Solo trip out on the Llano River. I've been to this, this particular private campground before. Really looking forward to doing some fishing and just getting out of nature. So that's coming up, and it's just an overnight trip. Then I've also planned and booked flights and accommodation to go stay in southern Mexico in Oaxaca, which is the food capital of Mexico. So I'm very excited about e eating some fresh food all the fresh foods they have to offer, fresh seafood and everything, and just getting, spending some, some kind of really unstructured, chill time in a great, uh, a great area of the world. Um, I'll be spending a week or so down there in March, kind of mid-March, early March of next year. So I'm still planning on those. I asked my oncologist about that. Hey, I've got this trip planned. Should I cancel it? He said, no. He said, it's way too early to do that. So. The biopsy is going to tell us a lot more, uh, and I'll definitely give you guys an update for that and let you know, hey, it's not cancer, or nay, it is. And uh, at this point, it looks like my oncologist is like, eh, it's probably cancer. So that's that's my that's what I'm kind of stealing myself for, making my brain ready for. So uh, that I feel like I just kind of unloaded a whole bunch of stuff on you guys. Um, thanks for listening and being there. Um, you, your presence means more and support and everything means way more to me than I can express. Um, prayers and everything. And, and if my going through this and sharing the experience for you seems helpful, great. Maybe you've got a family member or a loved one who's going through this. If, this, if, if my little story can give you, uh, kind of fill in some of the blanks, because that's what cancer is. It's just a whole bunch of unknowns, right? Yeah, it's bad. I don't know how bad it is. I don't know what my options are. I don't even know how to wrangle all of this together in my head to make it make sense. That's part, that's part of the reason I, I'm doing these updates at all, is just if it helps anyone, fantastic. I hope it does. And then the other part is just to let my friends and family and loved ones know where I am and um, in, in, a, in a practical way. So. Um, anyway, thanks again. I, I love you all. Thanks for being here and your support and everything. Expect more updates from me. I'll definitely let you know. And the adventure, the weird 
twisty, turny adventure continues. <laughs> Um, and that's what it feels like. It feels like an adventure with an unknown ending. But uh, I will talk to you guys next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.